So this has been a highly complicated chapter, hasn't it? Because what we've learned so far is we have covered how to maintain a resting membrane potential in the axon. We have talked about how the impulse is uh, generated in the axon. And we have also talked about how the impulse moves along one axon. Then we have covered how the impulse moves from one neuron to another neuron along the synapses or synapses. <laughs> uh, we have covered that as well. Yeah, that took a lot of videos, by the way. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have talked about all that, right? So the question here is then, how do we start the action potential? So to un to, before we answer that question, we also have to give some context to that question. What does it mean by to start the action potential? See, I'm just drawing out the sensory neuron here, and I want you to see this flow uh, of the this flow that needs to happen when we want to detect a stimulus and produce a response. The stimulus must first be detected by something called as a receptor, and the receptor will then send the signal to the sensory neuron. So you see, to start the action potential in the sensory neuron, you need something called receptors, because the function of the receptor is to actually detect the stimulus and convert them into electrical impulse. That means the sensory neuron cannot just, you know, start an action potential or electrical impulse spontaneously. They, they cannot just do, they cannot just generate and send an impulse. They need to send an impulse when the receptor tells them to. Because the receptor is the one that is telling you, the receptor is the one that is detecting what is going on around the world, uh, what is going around, what is going on around us. For example, the receptor in our eyes are to are to detect light. The receptor in our nose are to de are to detect when someone farts. The receptor in our ears are to detect when a cat meows nearby. Um, so. You know, these are important, very, very important things that are happening in the world right now. The function of the receptor is to detect the stimulus and convert them into electrical impulses. That's what they're supposed to do. Only when they convert it into the electrical impulse, that's when the sensory neuron can generate the electrical impulse in their axon. That's when they can move the electrical impulse along their axon. And that's when they can send the electrical impulse across the synapses to the next neurons until eventually, uh, for example, it reaches your brain and then your brain tells you what's going on with the world. Now, so I'm this I'm just drawing out the sensory neuron here, and you can see those purple color small purple color squares, and those purple color squares just represent receptor cells. Receptor cells are usually connected to the sensory neuron, or they may have a bit of a gap between themselves and the sensory neuron. And as you can see here, I'm just magnifying one part. The receptor cell has a tiny gap. Uh, with the axon of the sensory neuron. Okay, so what actually happens is the stimulus is detected by the receptor cell. How it detects the stimulus, I'll explain that later. But something happens within the receptor cell where it will generate the action potential in the sensory neuron. So, how do we actually start the action potential or how does the receptor convert the stimulus into an action potential? To answer that question, we have to look at this diagram. We will use one example. Even though there are many different types of receptor cells, we are only going to focus on chemoreceptor cells in our tongue to detect saltiness or the salty taste. Now, I know saltiness means something else, you know, as a meme or whatever. But when I say saltiness, I just mean that taste, right? <laughs> One of my students was like, teacher, saltiness means something different. I was like, yeah, I know, I'm not that old. But um, yeah, anyway, moving on. So I'm just drawing out the axon of the sensory neuron, and I'm also drawing out the chemoreceptor cells in your tongue. They are supposed to detect the saltiness, and they have sodium ion channels. They do. They also have sodium ion channels, and guess what? They have a calcium ion channel. They have vesicles with neurotransmitters. And you might be thinking, hey, wait a second. This kind of looks like a synapse 
structure. It does. That is why it's not too difficult. And on the axon of the sensory neuron, guess what? They have receptors which are complementary to the uh, neurotransmitters and ligand-gated sodium ion channels. Now, you don't need to know the name of the neurotransmitters in this case. It is not acetylcholine. They can have different types of neurotransmitters. But in the exam, when you're talking about the chemoreceptor cells, just keep the name as neurotransmitter, just generally. Just a generalized name is good enough. And a thing I also want you to understand is the chemoreceptor cells, they are not neurons technically. They are not nerve cells or neurons, but they also maintain a resting membrane potential. As I'm putting here, the inside is negative, has a negative symbol, the outside has a positive symbol. You don't need to know the value. This is just, you just have to know that they maintain their own resting membrane potential. That's good enough. Now, if you are quite well versed with all the things that we have studied so far, this will not be very difficult at all. So, how does the chemoreceptor cell detect something that is salty? So, what happens first is, when you eat something salty, the stimulus is the salt, right? And the reason why something is salty is because of the sodium ions inside the salt because it's sodium chloride so the sodium ions that you ate will actually cause the sodium ion channels to open and guess what when the sodium ion channels open there you go the sodium ions rush into the chemoreceptor cells and when the sodium ions rush in what happens to the membrane potential Yep, same thing. The inside becomes a higher charge. The outside has a lower charge. So you just basically have to say, as you can see, positive symbol on the inside, negative symbol on the outside of the cell. And then what happens is the receptor cells depolarize. And when the receptor cells depolarize at one part, it causes the next part to depolarize, which causes the next part to depolarize, which causes the next part to depolarize as well. And when it reaches the calcium ion channel, same thing like you studied in the synapse, the calcium ion channel opens and calcium ions rush in. And when the calcium ions rush in, it causes the exocytosis of the neurotransmitters. And guess what? They bind to the receptors on the axon or the postsynaptic neuron. You can just call it the postsynaptic neuron if you want to. But this is what causes the sensory neuron to start to depolarize. That's what generates the action potential in the sensory neuron. So the salt that you ate will cause the receptor cells to depolarize, which will then cause exocytosis of neurotransmitters, which causes your sensory neuron to depolarize successfully. And when your sensory neuron depolarizes successfully, it will send the impulse along the axon of the sensory neuron, goes towards the relay neuron, motor neuron, and if it, uh, sorry, it goes towards the relay neuron, and usually it reaches your brain, and then your brain tells you, aha, you are eating something that is tasting quite salty. That's how your nervous system all works together to tell you what's going on around the world. So, we are going to talk about a little situation here though, however, and we have two people, person A and person B. Now, person A eats food with very little salt and person B eats food with slightly more salt than person A. Now, those dots over there represent the amount of salt that the person's eating. The amount of salt is so little that when they eat it, the receptor cells will try to depolarize. This is the membrane potential in the receptor cells. But even though it tries to depolarize, it does not reach a value. And that value is the receptor potential. We studied something called a threshold potential in neurons in the previous video. I'm going to put that in the top right corner. It's the same concept. And if the receptor cell does not reach the receptor potential, the entire chemoreceptor cell does not depolarize at all. And if it doesn't depolarize, they cannot generate an action potential in the sensory neuron. And therefore, person A does not taste anything salty at all. However, for person B, because there's more salt in their food, the sodium ion more sodium ion rushes into their receptor cells, and when the membrane depolarizes, the chemoreceptor cell reaches the receptor potential, and guess what? The membrane successfully depolarizes, calcium ions rush into the cell, exocytosis of neurotransmitters happen, and therefore, the sensory neuron in this case will successfully depolarize. And when the sensory neuron successfully depolarizes, as you can see here, 
um, it will be able to send the signal all the way to the brain. And when it sends the signal all the way to the brain, the brain will tell, ah, you are able to detect some salt inside the food. This food is salty. So long story short, if the stimulus is very weak, it's unable to reach the receptor potential, it's unable to generate an action potential. But if the stimulus is stronger, it's able to reach the receptor potential in the chemoreceptor cells, and they are able to generate an action potential. And of course, once they generate the action potential, it follows the all or none law. The all or none law is very simple. The neurons either transmit an impulse or they don't. Now, some students are like, of course, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> it's not like they transmit anything else. What I mean by this is when there's a very weak stimulus or no salt, the receptor cells do not depolarize because it does not reach the receptor potential. And in this case over here, there are no action potentials generated in the sensory neuron whatsoever. But when it's able to reach the receptor potential, when there's some salt, the sensory neuron will generate the action potential, and the action potential will always move all the way until the end. There is no such thing as the action potential will just stop halfway in the sensory neuron. As long as you are able to generate an action potential, it will always 100% reach all the way until the end of the sensory neuron. There's no such thing as your sensory neuron deciding to like, you know what, I'm just going to stop. We're just going to stop halfway and not generate the action potential. No. The all or none law just basically says this. If there's no action potential, nothing happens. But if there is an action potential, it will always go all the way until the end of the neuron successfully. Unless there is a damage in the neuron. So just be aware of what the all or none law is all about. Usually it's like a one mark question anyway. Where the neurons either transmit an impulse or they don't. Simple as that. Now... What I want to cover, however, also is the nature of the stimulus. What I mean by the nature of the stimulus is as follows. You see, we have a brain, right? And the brain's function, I mean, they have many functions, but one of the main functions of the brain is they are supposed to generate um, our perception of the world. They're supposed to tell you what's going on. When you taste something sugary, it's your brain that's telling you that, ah, this tastes uh, sweet. When you hear someone talking, the, your brain is the one that is telling you that, hey, someone's talking to you. This is what their voice sounds like. Um, now, some students are like, no, I thought my ears are doing it. I thought my tongue is tasting it. No, the receptors in our tongue and our ears and our eyes and every other parts of our body are sending electrical impulses to the brain. So the brain just receives electrical impulses. But how does the brain know that, oh, this electrical impulse is something to do with taste. This electrical impulse is something to do with smell. This electrical impulse is something to do with light or vision. How does the brain know that? To keep it very simple, the brain just interprets the location of the sensory neuron sending the impulse. For example, if you can see my diagram here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the color of the brain in a different color. Uh, so it's a bit you know lighter, so you can see that. When our nose detects smell. When the sensory neuron, those, that green color line, sends the impulse, it sends an impulse to a different part of the, of the brain. And the taste, when our tongue detects taste, the sensory neuron, which is in orange, it will send the impulse to another part of the brain. So depending on the location the brain receives the impulse, our brain is able to distinguish that, oh, this impulse has something to do with smell and this impulse has something to do with taste. Now, how does the brain differentiate it? It's because different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. So there is a taste center in your brain. There is a smell center in your brain. They're quite close to each other, by the way. Uh, but we don't have to go into the detail of that. So that's how your brain actually distinguishes or differentiates the type of electrical impulse based on the location the sensory neuron sends the impulse to. But let's look at another example. Your eyes, okay, your eyes are not at the back of your brain, but I'm just, you know, simplifying this structure over here. Now we have two eyes. Look at that. Both of them are sending the impulse to uh, the same part of the brain, by the way, uh, which is at the back. Okay, the visual cortex or the visual center of your brain is actually at the back of your brain. Um, one eyeball is exposed to very dim light and one eyeball is 
exposed to a stronger light. So one is a weaker stimulus and one is a stronger stimulus. So how does your brain know that, hey, one light is a weaker stimulus and one light is a stronger stimulus? Some students will say, oh, uh, the amplitude of the impulse, you know, the value of the impulse will be much higher or much smaller. Instead of reaching positive 30 millivolts, it's able to reach positive 80 millivolts. No, it's not. No matter how strong or weak the stimulus, the amplitude or the, the value of the impulse is all going to be exactly the same. When, it de when the neurons depolarize, it will always th hit positive 30. When it repolarizes, it will usually go down to about negative 80 and then returns back to its resting membrane potential. So how does the brain know that one stimulus is weaker and one stimulus is stronger? The interesting thing here is when you actually measure the action potential in the sensory neuron, we notice something very interesting. For the weaker stimulus, it generates a less frequent action potential, and for the stronger stimulus, it generates a higher frequency of the action potential. The brain interprets the frequency of the action potential. The more frequency or the higher the amount of the action potential, the brain goes, ah, this is actually a stronger stimulus. It's the same when you're tasting something mildly sweet or very sweet. When you taste something mildly sweet, it will generate less action potentials. When you taste something extremely sweet, however, your tongue generates, the sensory neuron generates a higher frequency of the action potential. That is how it's supposed to work and that's how your brain I mean, as an oversimplification, this is how the brain perceives the world. It interprets the impulse based on the location of the sensory neuron, and it also interprets the impulse based on the frequency of the action potential as well. So it knows that, oh, this is a weak stimulus and this is a strong stimulus. There was a nice video that uh, was mentioned in Crash Course that I loved. And, and it said something very beautiful. You can check out the link. I'll put it in the description as well. Uh, it says that whether it is a tiny spider on your leg or whether an elephant steps on your leg, the amplitude or the value of the action potential is always going to be the same. What is going to be different is the frequency of the action potential. An elephant stepping on your hand will generate more action potentials, basically. <laughs> so I hope you understand this part. With this, we are actually done with, you know, the neuron part of the chapter. And the next part of the chapter, we will have to focus on the skeletal muscles, which is quite hard as well. So I hope you brace yourself for that.